Hi folks, welcome back to the Tabletop's Edge and our last Blitzkrieg playthrough. Today, I'm just going to give you an overview, a very brief overview of the game situation before we take a closer look at the American side of the setups, maybe discussing their uh, initial positions and perhaps some of the uh, difficulties they may be encountering uh, early in the game. So with that said, Let's not waste any more time and get right to it. Now, here is the entire map. It's all four maps for the campaign scenario. And as we get a little closer here, you'll see uh, it starts off, it covers a little sliver of Germany on the east. Uh, moving west to the front line here, there are a couple of major uh, river obstacles. The Ore River starts up way up here, and it's gonna wind itself basically north-south down along the uh, the front line as it flows into the Sauer River in the south here, which then continues along the front line over almost to the southeast corner of the, uh, of the maps. Now the Germans are going to be looking to punch a hole here and drive westward as quickly as possible before the Americans can recover and start to reinforce the sector, you'll see the other major river is the Meuse way out here in the west, and it's going to run north along the west edge of the maps before turning north, uh, I'm sorry, before turning east and heading off to the, uh, to, the, to the northeast there. The Germans, again, for their sudden death victory conditions, are going to need to get two panzer divisions, two SS panzer divisions, the 2nd and 9th, off of the map exiting at the entry points that are located along the north edge here. The furthest eastern entry point is this road here. That's the closest in terms of hexes, but it may not be the easiest to reach. We'll have to see how things uh, unfold there. The game actually splits very nicely into a northern sector and southern sector for both sides. So it's an excellent scenario to play uh, with four players, two per side. And I just wanted to point out, you may have noticed along the edge of the uh, map here, these cards. These are the HQ cards that uh, I talked about in my review. And I'd like to take a second and show you uh, the cards close up. Here we have a sample card, uh, in this case for Combat Command B of 9th Armored Division. These cards were created by Paul Billings and uh, have been uploaded to the Gamers Archive website. If you look on the last Blitzkrieg page underneath the Battalion Combat Series section of the website, you'll be able to find these and download them. Uh, I printed mine off on uh, just some standard card stock, so they're a little bit stiffer, but these really are a godsend, especially for someone like me who really uh, likes a clean map board. It keeps a tremendous amount of marker clutter off of the map, which makes it easier, I think, to kind of see what's going on and uh, just makes it a more attractive uh, uh, map to play over. So on the card, you can see it's broken down into six sections. The upper left-hand corner includes a very nice uh, uh, unit symbol. To the right of that, we've got a box to place the fatigue marker for that particular formation. Below that, any attached artillery asset uh, markers are placed there. There's a section to note whether it's in prepared defense or not, and then you have two boxes uh, to stack any support that is attached to the formation. So this is a blank card, but if I come down over here, you can see for the opening setup, we've got a couple of the American formations here. And what I'd like to do is take the activation marker and I will place the activation marker on this card until the formation is activated. Once the formation is uh, done for the turn, I'll take the uh, formation marker and I will place it on top of the headquarters unit. So for instance, if the 99th Infantry Division is done, I'll take that and here's the headquarters for the 99th and I'll just place that there. What that does is it allows me at a glance with uh, my formation HQ cards here, I can tell who has activated and who has yet to go. And you can see we've got uh, the fatigue markers here. We've got some artillery attachments 
prepared defense markers and our support units for these things. And like I said, these have just been a godsend uh, for this game. I really, I don't play it without them anymore. You can see the uh, German uh, formation markers here. And what I've done is <clears throat> I have split the front line into a north sector and a south sector and all of the American formations and the German formations that happen to be assigned to either the northern or southern sector at that point, I will keep their cards on that respective side of the map edge. Now, with BCS, most of the uh, combat units have steps. Uh, very commonly, your infantry battalions will have six steps, and the game provides a large number of strength point markers to keep track of the step losses. But again, I, I just, I do not like stacking. I do not like big stacks and the markers are prone to get knocked around. And therefore I am a roster guy. I, I really prefer using these um, roster charts, the loss charts to, uh, to mark the losses. Again, not only does it keep the map looking cleaner, but I also find these to be a, uh, a little more reliable way to, uh, to track losses. You can see here that the Americans, uh, the 2nd Infantry Division, and uh, when we look at those in a moment, you'll see why, but they are actually starting off with uh, one of the regiments pretty much at half strength. So just wanted to show you what the, uh, what the uh, headquarter formation cards look like how you use them, and we'll be seeing more of these uh, throughout the replay as it goes on. We begin our tour of the American positions up at the northern end of the map, where you will find the 2nd Infantry Division and 99th Infantry Division located. Now, this whole area up here is the southern portion of the American 5th Corps sector. The rest of 5th Corps is just north of the map here, and uh, Fifth Corps was preparing a, a big attack on the Roar River Dams. And as part of that, 2nd Infantry Division, headquartered here, has been attacking to the, uh, to the northeast through the German West Wall. The West Wall fortifications are denoted by these red outlined hexes in the game. And they've made uh, some slow progress over the preceding three days. They've managed to capture the village of Wallerscheid, which they have nicknamed Heartbreak Crossroads. And in their attack, they're being supported by one regiment of the 99th Infantry Division. Now, the 2nd Infantry Division is actually one of the better American formations in the game. They have an action rating four, as you can see um, on the infantry battalions here. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with BCS, uh, like the OCS games, BCS assigns an action rating to every unit to represent the unit's overall quality. Uh, things like its training, uh, morale, uh, equipment, that kind of stuff. And the scale they use goes from zero to five, where zero are the worst and five are the elite units. So when you see a five action rating unit in a BCS game, uh, or an OCS game for that matter, you're looking at uh, you know the best of the best and elite unit. So with the 2nd Infantry Division having a four, you know they are a solid, um, formation that, uh, that, that that's going to fight well. Now they have two regiments that have been pursuing this attack up here. The 9th Regiment actually is the one we saw on the uh, loss charts that uh, has been reduced to about half strength. And really, I guess technically it'd be more accurate to say they've lost half of their combat effectiveness because the, the steps in BCS are not necessarily uh, strength points from that perspective. So um, it, they, they're really more a reflection of the, the staying power that, uh, that a particular unit has, which is one reason why uh, combat strength isn't affected by the number of steps that a, uh, that a unit still possesses, because we're not necessarily talking about uh, a unit, um, if it has six steps, 
and it's lost three steps, that doesn't necessarily mean that the unit is down to literally 50% combat strength left. Um, it's more uh, an, an issue of the combat effectiveness being eroded, and then it'll reach the point uh, when it loses its last step, the uh, combat or the unit is essentially combat ineffective and is removed from the game until uh, until it can be reformed. Um, but I digress. Uh, Ninth Regiment uh, has been chewed up a bit in the attack here. They do have the second ID has one regiment in reserve up here at Camp Elsenborn in the rear, and that brings me to the 99th. Infantry Division, which is headquartered here in the twin villages of uh, Rosharat Krinkelt. And the 99th, along with supporting the attack up here with the regiment, has its other two regiments deployed to protect the flank of 2nd ID's push. And they're deployed here to the east on a, on a north-south line, all the way down to Loschheimer Graben um, and the northern edge of the Losheim Gap. Now the 99th is a, um, a less experienced unit, however, they, uh, they do have a decent action rating for a relatively green unit of, uh, of three. So they're not quite as good as 2nd Infantry Division, but they are by no means a, uh, a poor unit and uh, really do have the potential to, to hold their own against a lot of um, enemy units in the in the course of the game now normally you'd be looking at these two units having been mixed and coordinated because the 99th uh, formation blob starts down here and comes all the way up this is a battalion of the 99th so obviously the second infantry division is mixed right into the middle of the 99th position however in the game, these two infantry divisions are considered buddies, uh, and therefore they don't have to worry about uh, suffering from mixed or coordination um, for, uh, modifiers on their snafu die rolls. And I believe that's because historically the 99th was placed under operational uh, command of the more experienced 2nd Infantry Division. So essentially what you have is, uh, you can think of the two formations, it's almost like one big giant formation um, in the game, and that's going to present some opportunities for the Americans uh, moving forward, and, and we may end up seeing how that, uh, how that plays out. Now, before we move on from the 2nd and 99th Infantry Divisions, I just want to give you a um, quick look at their headquarters cards to give you an idea of the situation that they're in. Uh, you can see 2nd Infantry Division, because of the attacks that it's been making over the past few days, does start out with a fatigue level of one. They do have five artillery points, uh, or asset points assigned to the division. So when combined with the four organic artillery points they have, they've got a total of nine artillery points available, which is quite a bit. I don't think you're gonna see any other formation on either side in this game that has that many artillery uh, points at, uh, at the beginning. You can also see, being a good uh, unit, not only action rating wise, but they are well supported. They have not one, but two tank destroyer uh, battalions in support. One is a towed tank destroyer and the other is a self-propelled, along with a tank battalion. Now the 99th Infantry Division, uh, they're not fresh, but they do have a fatigue of zero, and fatigue zero is is kind of the baseline in BCS. Not many units will be uh, fresh. Uh, those that are fresh, once they lose that, they can never regain it. So for the most part, uh, fatigue zero is about as, as good as you're going to get with uh, when it comes to fatigue. They also have two artillery points assigned. They are in prepared defense, and they have a single towed tank destroyer battalion in support. Now, next up, we're gonna be looking at the 14th Cavalry Group. So since we've got the card here, we'll just take a quick look at that. Again, fatigue zero, they are in prepared defense, but they have no artillery or support units assigned to them. So let's go take a look and see where 14th uh, Cavalry Group is set up. Now you can see here the southern end of the 99th Infantry Division's line facing to the east. 
there's uh, the Losheim Gap here, and between the 99th and the 106th Infantry Division, this gap is only being covered currently by the 14th Cavalry Group. You can see headquartered here at Manderfeld. Now they've got a couple of uh, squadrons. These units for the uh, 14th Cav are actually um, company-sized or squadrons rather than um, actual battalions. So these are only two-step units up here. The rest of the cavalry group is back here. They have the uh, 32nd uh, Recon Battalion back there, and they have a small um, company of uh, light tanks there in Manderfeld with the headquarters unit. Again, the Recon group is at pretty high quality with an action rating of four, but as you can see, they've got an awful lot of ground to cover in between the two uh, infantry divisions. And the reason you see the Americans so um, thinly spread out here at the beginning of the game is obviously, you know, the Americans were not expecting any major enemy activity on this uh, part of the front. And that's going to come back to bite them here, as we will see rather vividly in the first couple games of this turn. Now, the 14th Cavalry Group's job was to tie in from the 99th into the 106th. So let's take a look at the uh, 106th Infantry Division positions. Just a quick correction here. Something didn't look right as I was looking over the 14th Cavalry Group, and it was Able Squadron here. I had it I had it uh, stacked in one of these two hexes up here, which was incorrect. It's actually uh, down here further south in the gap. So uh, just... So no one starts scratching their heads when we get to the actual start of the game. I wanted to just insert this little correction here so that uh, we've got an accurate uh, setup of uh, 14th Cavalry Group's positions at the start of the game. Like the 99th Infantry Division, the 106th Infantry Division is another inexperienced uh, unit. However, unlike the uh, 99th, the uh, 106th only has an action rating of 2. Uh, again, tied into its historical performance at the battle. Now, the division is headquartered way back here in St. Bith, but the division has two of its regiments deployed way off to the east here along the, uh, the Schnee Eiffel, and then its line extends all the way further south, all the way down here. So it's a frontage of about, well, just under 20 kilometers that's being covered by, uh, by the division. And you'll note the division really doesn't have any reserves. They have, a, um, they have a small engineer battalion back here, and they have uh, one battalion, the 1st Battalion of the 424th, located here. But other than that, most of the, uh, well, really, the rest of the division is entirely in the front lines. Now, back here with the headquarters, there is a uh, very small engineer battalion in the town of St. Vith. So you can obviously see the vulnerability in, uh, in the situation here with the 106th. And if we look at their uh, headquarters card to see what kind of condition they're in, you can see uh, they do have fatigue zero and they are in prepared defense. They've got two artillery points assigned to them and they do have a single towed um, tank destroyer battalion for support. Um, but again, they are deployed rather far forward. Uh, in fact, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The um, part of their front line is actually outside of the command radius from their headquarters. That's how far forward. Uh, they are from the HQ. Part of that is, I think, by game design, in order to replicate um, the disaster that uh, befell them on the 16th, 17th, and 18th of December. So things are going to be pretty ugly in here uh, as a result of the, um, of the defensive positions here. And that kind of wraps up the whole northern half of the American line. Uh, those of you may have noticed there is another formation card here. This is for Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division. It does not start on map, but it arrives as a reinforcement uh, the first turn in the uh, St. Vit area. So once we get into the game and uh, that formation arrives, you'll see how they set up and where they go from here. Now let's go ahead and transition around to the southern end of the, uh, of the front and take a look at what the Americans have further south. 
and picking up with the uh, American front line just south of the 106. This is actually the right flank of the 106th front line. We're getting into the sector of the 28th Infantry Division, and unlike the other three American infantry divisions we've seen so far, in Last Blitzkrieg, the 28th Infantry Division is broken up into three separate regimental formations, which does not bode well for that particular unit. Again, you can see the um, headquarters for the 112th Infantry Regiment is located here at Uren, and you'll also see that the formation marker is stacked on top of the headquarters, indicating that the headquarters is done. What this means is that on the 16th of December, turn one of the game, the 28th Infantry Division will not get an activation. It's already considered done. Now, it's deployed with two of its battalions east of the Ore River, and its third battalion, actually, it's the second battalion, um, is located just to the east of it, of, of the, uh, of the Ore River. It's a relatively small sector, but Again, this is only a regiment with literally these three infantry battalions to cover that ground. So moving further south, let me pull back a little bit here and give you a kind of a little better idea of the frontage that the 28th Infantry Division uh, is going to have to hold compared to what we've seen so far. So the 28th starts right up here, and it's basically covering all of this front line along the Ore River, all the way down, this is still all the 28th Infantry Division sector. Their 3rd Regiment, the 109th, is headquartered here in Dekirk. So basically, from the Zaur River, all the way up the Ore here, to tie in to the uh, 106, this is all a single Infantry Division's sector. And you can see it's just absolutely enormous. You'll also note that there aren't that many American units in this sector. South of the 112th that we just looked at, we'll find the 110th Infantry Division, or Infantry Regiment. And this regiment has more units, but that's because they've been uh, split up into their company components. So we have Alpha Company of the 1st Battalion located here. Here's Bravo Company and Charlie Company. So now we've gone from not just having um, a division broken down into a regimental formation, but now this regiment doesn't even have its battalion units, it's got its units broken down into companies. The lone exception to that, they've got 1st Battalion here and they've got 3rd Battalion covering this enormous sector. The regimental reserve is the 2nd Battalion. This is the only battalion sized unit in this formation. What that means is these companies, if we get a little closer look at them, you can see they only have two steps, maybe three steps in the companies, which makes them easier to eliminate. And the yellow circle around the action rating, it's a good action rating, it's a good unit, um, indicates that these are non-rebuildable units. So once the Germans eliminate Bravo of the 1st Battalion, or I guess back then it'd be Baker Company of the 1st Battalion, uh, that unit's gone and it's never coming back, which means the one-tenth is going to be very hard to uh, to keep on the map, and it's going to disintegrate in a, uh, in a usually in a rather spectacular fashion. Now, the one uh, bit of help that the 28th Division as a whole has is uh, the uh, CCR, the Reserve Combat Command from 9th Armored Division, is located uh, right up here around Trois Vierges, just behind the front line. And the problem with that is it's not a very good unit. You can see the action rating, uh, action ratings of two, and it's composed literally of three task forces. So there's not much to it. Uh, if the Germans decide to cross the Ore River here in force, which as you can see, they are primed and ready to do, there's not a heck of a lot in this area that's going to be able to stop them. And just for reference, we've got the 110th headquartered here in Clairvaux, and Bastogne is located over here. So between Bastogne and the river, with all of these German divisions, you've got a couple of regiments and a small armored combat command. Now we'll take a look at the headquarters cards down here, and you can see the 112th 
fatigue zero. So the 28th is rested. And I believe this unit was the one that was involved in the fighting in the Hurtgen and had been moved to this quiet sector in order to rest and, uh, and recover. They're all in prepared defense. The 112th and 110th each have some support. However, the 109th, which is located down here in the south, headquartered at D. Kirk, and they've got a couple of regiments uh, forward here, uh, has, has no uh, organic support assigned to them. Uh, let's see, we looked at CCR 9. Uh, they've got one fatigue level and a single artillery point. So the other formations that are in the south for the Americans, you've got Combat Command A of the 9th Armored Division and the 4th Infantry Division. So let's take a look at their positions. Now, extending from the uh, from the right flank of the 28th Infantry Division, uh, their 109th Regiment, you've got CCA of the 9th Armored Division. Again, it's a small formation. It uh, has, I believe, we have a... a there's an armored infantry battalion there. We have uh, an armored recon battalion and one tank battalion. And it's a fairly narrow sector of front that they are holding. And then just to the, uh, just to the east of the Ernst Noir River, you get into the 4th Infantry Division's sector. Now the 4th Infantry Division is the other uh, good veteran infantry division that the Americans start with um, at the beginning of the game. You can see them deployed here. The problem down here with the 4th Infantry Division is you don't have the whole division. There's only about a reinforced regiment of the division uh, actually that starts on the uh, on the map at the beginning of the game. So you're looking at maybe a third of the infantry division. Uh, they they will get some reinforcements as, uh, as it uh, as the game progresses, but you can see they've got a fairly sizable sector here to hold, uh, including the city of Echternach right on the uh, right on the river there. The Fourth Infantry Division and Ninth uh, and CCA of the Ninth, they're both in prepared defense. The Fourth Infantry Division does have some artillery uh, assets assigned to it. Let's see if I can get that. They do have four points, so they've got almost as many as the Second ID. And they have, again, they've got plenty of support. They've got a tank battalion. They have um, uh, a tank destroyer and a towed tank destroyer battalion in support. And um, CCA of the 9th actually has their own um, tank destroyer battalion. This actually is a, has a nice range of uh, three hexes on it, which you don't see very often. So uh, again, both formations pretty fresh with uh, fatigue zero. Now that's going to pretty much do it for the uh, at-start American positions here in the game. They have a grand total of uh, five infantry divisions, one armored division, and a cavalry regiment on uh, on map at, uh, at the start of the game. And uh, as you'll see, that's really nowhere near what they uh, need to have uh, to, uh, to try to stop the, uh, the impending German attack. Now you'll notice I haven't talked much about any plans for the Americans and a couple of reasons for that. Um, first, the Americans are blissfully unaware of uh, what is about to be unleashed on them on uh, the 16th of December. But, uh, but we are playing a game here and we know as uh, the American player what exactly is coming our way. However, the initiative is squarely with the Germans uh, at the beginning of the game. And so making any plans at this point um, are is really kind of futile because by the time the Americans get a chance to, uh, to react, uh, this map is going to look very, very different. And they're going to have to respond to the, uh, to the German successes as best they can. So really with the Americans, it's a case of waiting and seeing how the German attack develops and, uh, and where the real danger spots are, and then being flexible enough to, um, to try to plug the, uh, the gaps in the line. It's very much, for the Americans, uh, it's very much a case of just throw something in the way. I don't care what it is, it's probably going to die, it's not going to last terribly long, but we really just need to throw something uh, in the way, in the form of a speed bump or a roadblock, something to uh, to slow down the Germans until 
the Americans can start to get uh, their forces built up. And hopefully they can, uh, in that process of slowing down the Germans and containing them a little bit, they can also wear them down a bit, making the, uh, making the eventual counterattack that much more effective. So that's it for our American briefing, if you will, our pregame look at, uh, at their side of the lines. Next up, we'll take a look at the German front lines and discuss some of the plans of what they're going to try to do initially. Thanks for watching today. Take care, and we'll see you next time.